Let's pray as we prepare our hearts for the word of the Lord today. Father, I thank you today as we celebrate uh, so many things. We thank you, Lord, for just favoring Christ the Rock Community Church again to be a beacon of hope on October 31st in advance. We pray that you would go before us. We pray for resources. We pray for people, sources, Lord Jesus, that will come and partner with us. Then, Lord, we pray on that night that you would send the hurting, send the wounded, send the downtrodden, send those who need to hear that hope is found in Jesus and Jesus alone. There is still hope. Now, Lord, as we turn our face to the word, bread of heaven, feed us till we want no more. As we talk about an important time in which we live, Habakkuk, that you would speak to every heart today. May we all leave changed by the power of your word. Bread of heaven, feed us. Feed us till we want no more. Lord, we pray today that no flesh will get glory in the presence of our holy God. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the church say amen. I want you to turn back in your Bibles to Habakkuk chapter 3. And I purposely got to this chapter and I began to slow down. Because I want to try to, and I've asked the Holy Spirit to give me insight for us. For us. How, how can you move from despair to declaring the works of God? How can you move from worship, I mean, from worrying to worship? How can you move from being just discouraged to being content in the Lord? And I think in chapter number three, it's transitional. In chapter number three, we have coined it the finale. It is the finale. As I've done my research, uh, uh, authors, or I should say scholars, have set Habakkuk aside as one of those books that's transitional in any time in which we live. They liken it unto the story of even Job. This man of God, this nobody, as it were, that would appear and then disappear into biblical antiquity, never to be mentioned again. And we have coined this time, and we've seen three things. Well, we saw last week that God calls us in this hour to pray for revival. If there's ever a time when the church needs to be revived, it is now. If there's ever a time for there to be an entity on this world that still believes in the power of God, it is the church of God. And again, I'm not talking about a building. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about me. If there's ever a time where people need to square their shoulders and say, yes, there is still hope. Yes, I am not caught in despair. I believe that this is going to change, and I believe that it's working out for my good. It is our responsibility we need to pray for revival. Lord, when this is over, may your church, may your church shine as a beacon of light. Lord, when this is over, may people come by the thousands, the countless thousands, and come to know who Jesus is. I think in this hour, God is sharpening our faith. He is transitioning our faith. This past week, I got a an email from, uh, from one of our missionaries here in the church, a dear sister in the Lord, and this is by Christine Kane. It says, first things first, the key to following God's lead. Give careful thought to the paths of your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. Are you feeling trapped today? Are you wanting greater purpose, more fulfillment, or a burning passion for God and his ways? The fact is, sometimes you have to break up with where you are or where you've been to get to where God wants you to be. Revival and renewal don't happen through willpower. They start with repentance, a surrendered heart that has encountered the love and truth of Jesus and has decided to leave everything behind, break up to fully follow him. Is there anything you need to leave behind? Is there something or even someone you need to break up with? Is there a habit you need to drop? Listen to the Holy Spirit, and as you follow his leading, God will bless you and propel you into your purpose. God's calling us in this moment right here to seek him with all of our hearts because I think God is, I not, not, not think, I know God is up to something, and everybody should say amen, and he's up to something. He's doing something. Habakkuk chapter 3, you should be there already. This is one of the most remarkable poetic prayers in Scripture. At this point in Habakkuk's writing, Habakkuk pauses in his prayer to go back to remembering what God has done in the past. And I believe that, that what Habakkuk is doing is he's looking at the victories of the past to give him trust for the future. What Habakkuk is doing is what I would suggest for all of us to take a moment to consider the God of the past. The God of just six months ago. The God of coming into 2019, 2020, to consider the, the, the power and the acts and the wonders of God. 
please understand that when we do this, we will be convinced not only for your past, but you'll be convinced for your future. Please understand that we serve a God who has proven himself. It's not hard to find. It's not hard to, 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 to find the acts of God, the works of God. And this is where our faith must be found. We're not, we're not following a blind faith. God's not asking for a blind faith. God wants us to have a proven faith. And because God has already done it before, God will do it again. And this is what we see with Habakkuk. Habakkuk in chapter number three, and we'll read in just a minute, he takes an opportunity to refocus on the past. Your attention to Habakkuk chapter three, commencing at verse number three and following. This is what Habakkuk says from the New Living Translation. I see God moving. Can I pause right there? He says, I see God moving. In the midst of his despair, in the midst of his confusion, God gives him a theophany. Some scholars say that he actually had a vision to see God moving. Back to the scripture, it says, I see God moving across the deserts from Edom, and the Holy One coming from Mount Paran, Selah. So, so what Habakkuk says, I see God moving and pause and think about that. Pause and think about that God is moving right now. Consider that in this time where it seems that numbers of deaths are, are exceeding and going up higher and higher, you need to understand that God is not dormant. God is still moving. Habakkuk say, in the middle of this calamity, in the middle of certain doom, I see God moving. Think about that for a minute. That's what he says. His brilliant splendor fills the heavens, and the earth is filled with his praise. His coming is as brilliant as the sunrise. Rays of light flash from his hands where his awesome power is hidden. Pestilence marches before him. Plagues follow close behind. When he stops, the earth shakes. When he looks, the nations tremble. He shadows the everlasting mountains and levels the eternal hills. He is the eternal one. Let's stop right there. He says, he is the eternal one. My point today, last week was this time for revival. And today, this is the greater point. It is time to refocus. At this point, we have been in this pandemic for about six months. Now think about it. Six months of your life has been traumatized. Six months of your life, you've turned on the TV and you've seen exponential growth with the deaths and with the cases of COVID-19. In these six months, we've also seen unrest as never before. In these six months, we're hearing political talk that is, that is deafening. And to my, to my own, I will admit, I'm tired of hearing the talking heads. I am tired of hearing it. In six months, think about it. In six months, the whole school system has changed. In six months, the whole economy has, has fallen. In six months, all of us now are wearing masks. I wish you could see how you look. <laughs> In six months. But it's time for us to refocus. It is time for us to consider another view. And what Habakkuk does in these moments, in these words right here, as he is contemplating the picture that God has said, hey, the Babylonians are coming and they're fierce. They're going to tear your asunder. It's going to happen. And rather than look on what is about to happen or the future that's going to happen, Habakkuk chooses to pause and look at the victories of times past. Refocus for a, for a new perspective. See, understand this, that Habakkuk is still on his guard post. Habakkuk is still high. He's, he still has, as he's, he's getting this revelation from an elevated place. Because you have to refocus for a new perspective. We've got to change what we're looking for. Some of us, you need to turn off social media, turn off the TV, turn off some of these talking heads, and pick up the word of God. To refocus for a new perspective. And not only to refocus for a new perspective, but refocus for perseverance. This is Habakkuk's way to pretty much strap in. <laughs> to say, I know it's going to be tough, but now he refocuses. And what he does is he looks at the victories of times past. So what is ahead, preacher? Can I tell you, it won't be good. 
Israel is going to go through. As a matter of fact, the Babylonians are going to come through and, and, and Lamentations, and we'll go there in just a minute. Lamentations is going to write, uh, Jeremiah writes the book of Lamentations through this whole process. And Lamentations is all about grieving what's happening to the people of God. Listen, when the Babylonians come in, they're going to do unspeakable, horrible things to the people of Israel. They're going to suffer. They're going to take them away to captivity. They're going to kill the weak, and they're only going to keep the strong. Okay? They're going to kill the weak and only keep the strong. How do I know this? Because when you go to Daniel, remember Daniel and the three Hebrew boys, remember they were set aside because they had purpose for the people of Babylon. But the people that didn't have purpose, they died. They're going to pillage the temple. They're going to take all the gold and all the resources of Judah. They're going to take all them away and they're going to take the people resources and they're going to take them and they're going to leave their country to leave their land, their homes in ruins. They're going to ransack everything. They're going to strip them of all of their dignity in this process. And and this is going to happen. Watch this. And the worst part about this is Israel knows that they brought this on themselves. That they brought the very judgment of God upon them because they lost their ways. They began to worship other gods, and God had to bring judgment upon them because God is a holy God. Can I remind you today, church, we serve a holy God. And he's not going to pitter-patter. He is a holy God, and he requires us to be holy. Be holy as I am holy, says the Lord. They had rebelled against God, and this is going to happen and if you read the book of Lamentations, it is all about the captivity in the Babylon, for the Babylonians. Cameron Brucey says this, Lamentations, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah are rich with God's truth about sin and need of redemption, as well as his love for us and, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Together, these prophets express the pain and suffering of God's people as they live in the fallen world. The people suffer at the hands of their enemies, which have been sent by the Lord himself, but they are not without hope. Because God uses this form of fatherly discipline to sanctify and to restore them. I think that out of this process, the church, not the building, but the church of Jesus Christ, God is using this process to sanctify and to restore his church. He's doing it now. Preachers, you got time to refocus. Well, preacher, what do you do when you face sorrow and and the losses of life? How do you keep from sinking underneath the pressure of it all? How did Habakkuk uh, 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 find a way to not sink under the the, the dire uh, uh, thing, the the projection that God told him was going to happen? What was going to? How did Habakkuk handle it? The first thing Habakkuk did was to refocus on the grandeur of God. He began to talk about the power of God. Let me let me ask you something. How big? is your God. And as I was working on this sermon, I, I did a little research, and I, and, and I saw how different people have different sized gods, and there's some places you go, they've got 90-foot gods, and they've got small little gods you can put in your pocket. They've got all kinds of things. R- remember when the children of Israel, they built a golden calf. They built something that they began to worship. Let me ask you something. Church, how big, how grand is your God? Do you think that God has now come to 2020 and now he has run out of options, run out of resources, and now he's completely baffled. He's waiting for a vaccine too. Is that what you think? God is moving. And I think time for us to not make our God small, but we've got to make our God big. Because he is big. In fact, we don't have to make him, we have to acknowledge his bigness. This is what... Habakkuk is doing. He says, I see God moving. His splendor fills the heavens, and the earth is filled with his praise. His coming, verse 4, is come, is coming as bright as the sunrise. What Habakkuk says is this, just like you cannot stare at the sunrise, you cannot stare at a holy God. He said, I want to put it where you can get it. And what Habakkuk is doing, he is res- he's, he reminds himself of the grandeur of God. I see God moving. And just like you can't look at the sun and no one can see the holiness of God, so Habakkuk is reminding the reader, we serve a majestic God, a holy God, a pure. He is stronger than anything you can imagine. He is, he is wiser than anyone you can ever know. He is the first and the last. He is still God of gods. He is the one and true living God. And this is the same God today, church. We got to see him big. We got to see him powerful. 
We've got to see that he has not lost his way in the moment in which we live. He demonstrated his power. Then look what he does. He demonstrated his power. Look at verse number five. Pestilence marches before him. Plagues follow close behind him. And when he stopped the earth shakes, when he looks, the nations tremble. He shatters the everlasting mountains and levels the eternal hills. He is the eternal God. In fact, he's all powerful. He will always be in power. power. He, he's not transitional. He's forever. And he is the eternal God. Then look. What Abekah does, he says, the people of Cushan in distress and the nation of Midian tremble in terror. Now, what is he talking about there? He's talking about when Joshua came in and subdued the people and went into the promised land. What Abekah references now is a great power that God realized upon the people of Israel. He says, was it with anger, verse 8, that you struck the rivers, the Jordan River, and parted the sea, the Red Sea? Were you displeased with them? No. You were sending your chariots of salvation. You brandished your bow and your quiver of arrows. And he says, pause and think about that. Think about the power that God did. He moved nature for his people. He stopped the flow of Jordan and also of the Red Sea for his people. And if God can split the Red Sea, what can God not do for you, my brothers and sisters? We've got to make them big. We've got to remind ourselves of his grandeur. He split the sea. Look what he says in verse, he says, pause and think about that. Verse number 10, the mountains watched and trembled on what swept the raging waters. The mighty deep cried out, lifting his hands in submission. The sun and moon stood still in the sky as your brilliant arrows flew and your glittering spear flashed. What is he talking about there? That the sun and moon stood still. There's only one place in scripture where the sun stood still. And if the sun stands still, that means the moon is not moving either. And what Habakkuk says, that he remembers, remember the fight in Joshua chapter 3? When Joshua asked God to hold the sun, and the Bible says God held the sun and it would never, ever be done again. He's referencing the great battle of Joshua. And it says, just as God held the sun, he is still the same God who rules all things. Even nature responds to him. And I love this, this, this battle because in Joshua chapter 10, remember we studied this together. In Joshua chapter 10, the Bible says that God began to hurl stones of fire from heaven. God not only helped Joshua win the battle, but God fought the battle with Joshua. Brothers and sisters, how big is God to you? Think about that. How can you look back and see the victories of God in your life? How can you look back and see how you have been unemployed before? Just like God gave you a job before, he'll give you another job. How many of you remember how you've been sick before and God has healed you of sickness? He is still the same God today. I don't know about you, but every now and then I like to, I like to read old emails. Anybody like to read old emails? It's funny. And, you know, I like to read old emails of people that, that have said things and done things. And, you know, it, it, it bothers my wife because I say, oh, look at this. She said, like, I don't want to see that. That's old. I don't want to see that. I like, well, I'm just looking at it right now. Because sometimes you need to be reminded of the victories of God in your life. What has God done for you? Remember the person that said you'll never be nothing and look at you now? Remember the person who said, you'll never have a job. You'll never, ever be able to accomplish certain things. And yet, God, before you, who can be against you? Can I remind you, that is the same mighty God. That is the same grandeur. He's the same grand God that no one can stop the purposes of God. What God says to us is, and God will see the work done in you that he's purposed until the day of Christ Jesus. We got to we got to, brothers and sisters, see God in the middle of it all. Look at verse number 13. He says, you went out to rescue your chosen people to save your anointed ones. <laughs> he says, you went out, you, you protected, you rescued your chosen people, and you saved your anointed ones. Do you know that's how God sees you? God sees you as chosen, and God sees you as anointed. Do you understand that? <laughs> You anoint my head with oil and my cup burns over. He's talking about you. Do you see yourself, my brothers and sisters, as God's chosen one and God's anointed one? And understand, he will rescue you. And I love this. When he finishes this, he says, now think about that. 
Selah. This is a purposeful message to us today. We first of all, we got to refocus on the grandeur of God, and then we've got to refocus on the goodness of God. On the goodness of God. Let me ask you this. How will you remember 2020? <laughs> How will you recall 2020? And I would encourage you this, that you have to be intentional in remembering God's faithfulness or you are bound to forget them. It's easy to forget God's goodness. It's easy to forget. And when we forget God's goodness, then it brings all kinds of difficulties. We begin to wonder if God is there or if God really cares. We do this all the time. Hey, man, listen, if I... Listen, if God opened the Red Sea, I'd never question God anymore in my life. We judge. <laughs> man, man, listen, if God would just come and part the water in my pool, I'd never question him anymore. If God sent me a loaf of bread by Amazon, just, from, just sign it from God, I love you. I would never question his provisions for me. And the truth is, yes, you would. And so would I. God understands our propensity to forget. That's why God tells us over and over again to remember. God requires us to remember. Why does God require us to remember? Because God knows we are prone to forget. For those who have children, you know they will forget what you've done for them just from one day to the next day. As if, <laughs> I got a father, I just say yes. As if you've never provided for them, as if you've never come through for them, as if you're not the one that's been taking care of them all their lives. And sometimes you have to remind them, hey, when you were hungry with a bottle, I fed you. I know you want some Tito's now. I understand that. I've been feeding you all your life. Why would I stop now? Why would I stop now? And the water bottle said amen on that. <laughs> Listen, God wants us to remember how, and watch this, and what you remember out of 2020, you must be intentional to remember God's goodness. Otherwise, all you're going to rehearse is the, the bad things, the sorrowful things. You've got to be intentional. You've got to be purposeful to remember how God has blessed you. Now, preacher, but you don't know my story. I, I'm, I'm sitting here today, and, and y'all may be sitting here today, but, 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 but you don't know my story. And can I tell you the fact? that you're sitting here today, God has been good to you. <laughs> He's been good to you. <laughs> he has been good to you. And sometimes we complicate things. And because God hasn't given us this new thing or that new thing, and God provides for us day after day, the breath that you're breathing through your mask, God has given it to you. And he's a good God, church. And we've got to simplify it to those things. Otherwise, we will not reflect upon the goodness of God. I, I'm going to show you a story. Can I show you us in the Bible? Go in your Bibles to, to uh, Exodus chapter 14. In Exodus chapter 14, this gives you uh, uh, the story of the people of Israel coming out of Egypt. And I'm going to go here for a minute because this is the Egyptians pursuing them. This is God destroy them utterly, and I want to bring your attention, let's see, first of all, to verse number 29. But the Bible says this, and the Israelites had walked through the sea, I'm reading from the Holman, on dry ground with the water like wall to them on their left and their right. Now watch this. This said the water was like a wall. Can you imagine this now? Get that imagery. Preacher, this is what the Word of God says, and if you believe God's Word is true, then this is true. That they walked through the sea on dry land, and there was a wall of water on either side. Can you imagine that picture? The Bible says this. And that day the Lord saved Israel from the power of the, of the uh, Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. When Israel saw the great power of the Lord used against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and believed in him and his servant Moses. They feared the Lord and they believed in him. Because they saw his great power. Then watch what happens next. Then they break out in song. This is what Habakkuk is doing. Habakkuk saw the great power of God. And then he broke out in song. 
He broke out in a song, and this is what the people of Israel, they sang this song, and then later on, you're going to see at the end of it, verse uh, number 21, Miriam sang, and they danced, and she got a tambourine, and she began to make, make noise and make uh, uh, this beautiful song to God. Then look at verse number 22 of chapter 15. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went into the wilderness of shore, and they journeyed three days. How many days, church? Three days without finding water. They came to Marah. They could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter. This is why it's named Marah. And the people grumbled to Moses saying, what are we going to drink? Hold it. Three days before, you're looking at water on either side. Three days later, you grumbling, asking God, where's the water? Don't judge them, church. No, don't judge them. Okay, don't judge them. Okay, look at verse number uh, verse number, that's going down to verse number 25. So he cried out to the Lord. Moses cried out to the Lord, so he showed him a tree, and he threw the tree into the water, and the water became drinkable. That tree is imagery of the tree of the Christ of the cross. He made a statue, an audience for them of Mara. He tested them there. He did what, church? He tested them. This is a test. Three days into your journey, you're crying at, at me as if you've forgotten the great power I did just three days earlier. He says, if you're carefully to obey the Lord your God, do what is right in his eyes, pay attention to his commands, and keep all the statutes, I will not inflict any illness on you. I inflict it on the Egyptians, for I am Yahweh who heals you. Then it came to Elam, where there was 12 springs of water and 70 date palms, and they camped there by the waters. So watch this. God shows them, I'm going to show you something. I'm going to give you springs more than what you need and palm trees that you didn't ask for. Follow my ways. Okay, maybe they got it. Look at verse chapter number 16. The entire Israelite community departed to Elam and came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they left the land of Egypt. That's about 45 days. The entire Israelite community grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Wait a minute. 45 days in, they're still complaining. 45 days, a month and 15 days after seeing the wall of water on either side, they're complaining about the provisions of God. Let me ask you something, church. Six months into this pandemic and all the unrest that we're in, what is your commentary about 2020? Are you focused on the things that are so bad and just changing and just so evil? Are you focusing on the goodness of God? If you got a meal, I don't care if it's sardines or crackers, that's from the hand of God. Amen, church. God has been good to you. And we've got to focus on the goodness of God. Please understand, we're just like them. He says, now refocus on the goodness of God. 2020 will yield good memories. We're dealing with something that they said has not happened in, century, in a century. Think about this, 100 years. This has never happened before. What will be your commentary that you'll leave for your children? Uh, one of our staff members, John Jacarina, he, he called me as I was preparing the message last week. And he says, Pastor, you know, I just want to offer this up to you just to consider. Why don't you ask people to write their own song? I said, that's a great idea, John. And so this is from John. So don't get mad at me. John said this to y'all. Why don't you write your own song? And can I tell you that this song is a prayer? Why don't you write your own prayer out of 2020, of the grandeur of God, of the goodness of God? What will be your prayer? What will be your song? God says, now, don't forget my goodness. Can I remind you that in communion, he says, do this in remembrance of me. Why? Because he knows that if he does not tell us to do it in remembrance, we will forget the sacrifice of Jesus for our sins. What will you remember out of 2020? We must refocus on the grandeur of God and the goodness of God. And then lastly, we must refocus on the grace of God. God has been good to us, church. And watch this. Grace is something that we do not deserve. We're not here because we've been more careful than anyone else. We're not here because we sanitize better than anyone else. We're not here because we're just the best people. God said, I'm going to preserve these people because this is a good person. No, no, no. You are here. I am here because of the grace of God. It is the grace of God. 
Justin Holcomb says this, grace is, is most needed and the best understood in the midst of sin, suffering, and brokenness. But we live in a world of earning, deserving, and merit, and these result in judgment. That is why everyone wants and needs grace. Judgment kills. Only grace makes alive. A shorthand for what grace is, mercy, not merit. Grace is the opposite of karma, which is all about getting what you deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve and not getting what you do deserve. Christian teachers, Christianity teaches that we deserve what we deserve is death with no hope of resurrection. While everyone desperately needs his grace is not about us. Grace is fundamentally a word about God, his uncoerced initiative and pervasive, extravagant demonstration of care and favor for you and for me. Living in the grace of God is all about accepting the will of God. Do you understand that? When I live in the grace of God and understand the grace of God, the undeserved merited favor of God, then I must trust the will of God. Well, preacher, how do I find this? Look at verse number 16 of Rebecca chapter 3. He says, I tremble when I heard this, and my lips quivered with fear. My legs gave way beneath me, and I shook in terror. And look what he says in verse number, verse number 16, the second part. I will wait quietly for the coming day when disaster will strike the people who invade us. When Rebecca says, I'm done, I'm going to wait quietly for the day. I'm going to focus on the grace of God. And can I tell you this? It's probably pretty much accurate that, that Rebecca will not see the judgment of the Babylonians. If he's about 30 years old, and we know that they're in captivity, they're not in captivity yet, they will be in captivity for 70 years, that will make them over 100 plus years old, and the Bible does not record that. So it is probable that Habakkuk trusts God even though he has no evidence of the power of God. Because, remember, he learned early that the just must live by faith. And he's operating in faith. This is living active faith in God, where I can trust because the grace of God gives me the opportunity to have to trust the will of God in my life. Please understand, we must live in the context of Scripture rather than the context of this society. Can I say that again? You've got to live in the context of Scripture, not the context of this society. God's promises and covenants are a better indication of reality than the situation of circumstances we may find ourselves in. I'm almost done. Here we go. We must refocus on the grandeur of God, and we must refocus on the goodness of God, and we must refocus on the grace of God. Randy Alcorn says this, sometimes we make the foolish assumption that our Heavenly Father has no right to insist that we trust him unless he makes his infinite wisdom completely understandable to us. What we call the problem of evil is often the problem of our finite and fallen understanding. It was the hardest lesson I've had to learn. In our times of suffering, God doesn't give us answers as much as he gives himself. The promise God made to you and to me is, I will never leave you or forsake you. He did not promise in this world you will not have suffering, but he said, in this world you will have suffering, but... Be of good cheer. Why, church? Because I have overcome the world. Brothers and sisters, we've got to understand the, 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 the refocus on the goodness and grandeur of God. I will close with this. Turn your Bible to Lamentations chapter 3. Lamentations, remember, Lamentations, uh, Jeremiah writes his book, and, and he's writing from the mint, lament over Jerusalem. He's concerned about the conditions of the people. And in this place, some scholars say he writes this while the suffering is going on. He's lamenting over the condition of the people of God. And in this time, in the suffering, he writes the most eloquent understanding of the power of God in our lives. It's sometimes in the suffering that God gives us a complete understanding of the grace of God. You'd be surprised as the words that you will write out of this year will be powerful to someone in the, in the later, later years. You'd be surprised that God will use what he would place on your heart. Look at Lamentations chapter 3 and verse number 22. Look, this is what it says. It is because of the Lord's faithful love that we do not perish, for his mercies never end. Do you understand this, church? It is because of the Lord's great love that you're here today, because his mercies never end. They are new 
every morning, great is your faithfulness. Now, some of us have heard these verses before, but you don't, now you understand that this verse did not come out of the mountaintop experience. This verse, this understanding of God came out of the valley, came out of great suffering, came out of great duress, out of great sorrow. This is what Lamentation says. This is what Jeremiah says to us. Because of the Lord's faithful love, we will not perish for his mercies never end. They are new every day. I say the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will put my hope in him. Is the Lord your portion today? <laughs> or have we relegated the portion that you have to have amassed some kind of uh, education or some kind of money or some kind of things that this world would take away from us? But the Lord should be enough. And everybody say to man, is the Lord enough for you? The Lord is my portion. And I will put my hope in him. Watch this. This is in the middle of suffering. This is while it's going on. There's no breakthrough at this point. But, but, but uh, Jeremiah says, I'm going to put my hope in him. Look at verse number 25. The Lord is good to those who wait for him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him. To the person who seeks him, it is good to wait quietly for deliverance from the Lord. Would you just tell your neighbor with your mask on, just wait on the Lord. Just tell him, wait on the Lord. Wait. Wait on the Lord. The Lord is not done. The story of the church, the story of your life is not done. We got to wait on the Lord, brothers and sisters. And this is what Habakkuk says. When this is over, Habakkuk says, I'm going to just sit quietly. I'm done talking. I'm going to wait on the Lord. Do you feel like you're at the end of it? Do you feel like somehow you cannot put another foot in front of the next foot? I want to tell you, you've got to wait on the Lord. Great is your faithfulness, O Lord, my Father. There is no shadow of turning from you. Thou changest not your compassion, they fail not. Thou hast been and forever will be. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, your hand has provided. Great is your faithfulness, can you say this with me? Lord unto me. Father, today, I pray, Lord Jesus, that we would refocus. I just pray, Lord Jesus, that we would refocus on your power and your majesty, the grandeur of your presence. Father, I pray that we would remember and go back to look at the stories of old of how you vindicated your people. Even after suffering, even after judgment, you sustain your people. Father, some of us know the story that there's a remnant that will be sent back and they will rebuild the walls and they will rebuild the temple. And they will flourish and flourish and flourish after this, Lord Jesus. Why? Because the purposes of God will prevail. For the one that came this morning, Lord, that's on fumes, that's wondering where are you, I pray that they would see your goodness. You've been good to us, Lord Jesus. Even in our challenges, even in what we don't have and what we might need, we still must confess you have been good to us. Now, Lord, I pray that we would live in the wonder of your grace as we wait for your deliverance. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I've been led, I feel, by the Spirit after each of these messages to, to get an affirmation from you, not from me. But you would affirm to the Lord, I hear this rhema word, I hear you speaking to me. I'm going to plant your word deep into my heart. I'm going to see your majesty. I'm going to focus on your great grace. I'm going to wait until my deliverance comes. If that's your declaration today, would you just lift your hand to heaven and say, God, I've received that from you. I'm going, to, I'm going to look. I'm going to wait. I'm going to trust. I'm going to live by faith. Father, today, seal your word in our hearts. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Let the church say, amen.